all and welcome to the Famous and the Bad Fanatics Podcast. I'm your host, Danny Kubal. Today I have a very special guest, Emily Inkpen. Emily- Thank you. Thank you. How are you? Oh, excellent. Excellent. I didn't know if you wanted that as your title or uh, what was it? The, uh, the Dark Warrior Princess or? Dark Princess of Sci-Fi, but I really don't Dark, think that yeah, was yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love like that. I think about putting that in quotation marks for you. Uh, yeah. I really like it. My wife was like, that's like, really cool. Yeah. The seat, like the, the yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's tricky in this industry, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Are you serious right now? You're back. Can you hear me now? (laughs) (laughs) I tell (laughs) you. Oh, that's okay. It's still recording. It's nice because I can just stop and start the Zoom recording whenever. So it's just my computer wants a lot of time with me tomorrow, apparently editing before uh, I trade it in for a new one. (laughs) My friend's like, you want another backlog? I was like, I don't know now. Like, (laughs) Uh, but we'll start with that first question. Uh, What has your writing journey been like up until this point? Well, um, okay. I would say that it's been reasonably uh, as straightforward. Um, I graduated in English literature and after a year, you know, like that awkward phase after graduating and trying to find a job. So I found um, a job as a copywriter and I've been doing that ever since. Um, It's a day job. Um, I started writing The Blood Road a few years ago, uh, my first book. And, you know, as with all steps on the journey, I've gone where the opportunities have taken me, um, generally speaking, but I've always had the path in sight. Um, I sort of see my life as like, you know, the, the lighting of the beacons in Lord of the Rings, where yeah. you can see them. Yeah, it's sort of like that's that's sort of my approach to life and writing, actually, is is like I can see where I'm going, but how I'm going to get there is a mystery, you know, like that's, yeah. <laughs> that's kind of the that's kind of the deal. <laughs> I'm gonna be using that from now on. Like, <laughs> I love that scene. It's one of the best scenes I think in uh, in any movies, uh, movie set setting, TV setting, like game setting, anything. I talk about it all the time in my kids in class. Like, what are you talking about? I'm like, oh, I'm like, all oh, you kids that read fiction and nonfiction. I tell you, but yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. awesome. What I don't understand is like how the guys up on that mount, those mountains. What did they do to get that That's, job? I think about it all the time. Yeah, who who did you tick off? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like how how did you get that job? Yeah, yeah. One of my friends had such a he wrote a he wrote a paper about this, and he was like, "Oh, uh, I bet you it's like an old." He thought it would be like what veterans did once they became you know like disabled or something like that, or too old to fight or something, um, just so they could get some sort of pay or whatever. Um, I was like, that's so cool. I was like, that is a really interesting answer to a very mundane question that's always bugged me. So, yeah, well, I'll try and find it. <laughs> Put it on the website. How would they get really up cool. the mountain? If they're disabled, yeah, yeah, yeah. how would they get yeah, up yeah. the mountain? That's, that's what my friend said. He's like, hey, he's like, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying maybe they're older. Some of them are older. Okay. And we're like, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. But I was like, the one mountain scene, I was like, how do they, how do they get anything up there? <laughs> yeah. Like, how do they even eat? There were no farms around yeah. there. Like, just people yeah. in a hut. <laughs> there's not even trees. Like, so where do they get their wood? My friend's like, there's no wood pile outside that shed. I'm like, yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, it was cool. But yeah, there was, there's a lot of questions there. So, <laughs> so many questions that get raised just by that, that again, yeah. epic sequence. <laughs> Well, then the funny thing is, too, is that a recent paper had just come out and my friend was talking about where about the Eagles um, oh. and it was from the Sumerian and they were like, oh, yeah, you could have definitely just formed the Eagles there. Like, Gandalf oh, yeah. could have called any time. And I was like, they like ruined it even more for me. because so I was just like, oh, and then my friend was like, yeah, but Sauron's eye was there. I'm like, they could have at least gotten parked somewhere close to the stadium, you know, and then walk from there. So, yeah. Yeah, things that they get again in the Hobbit. They like they, they get the eagles, and then the eagles drop them off on this yeah. high point, and you can see yeah. the mountain. And I'm just thinking, could you not just, yep. just could you not just it's fly literally a right bit there? <laughs> literally right there. <laughs> it's totally true. My wife says all the time when I watch it, she's like, "You just gotta stop." And 
no, we don't stop. Like these are important. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she goes, these are not, these are not that important. Um, it's so funny that you said that. Uh, well, can you tell us what your first book is about? Because I know, um, like I've looked it up, but just for our audience, at least, it seems like a really cool premise, so. Um, well, the first book uh, is not out yet. It's in the same sort of like, it's a big sort of universe. Oh, cool. The first book um, is currently in publisher submission and uh, it's about this um, megalomaniacal weapons man manufacturer called Nathaniel Dex. And um, he's got these three kids who he adopted and he gave to his pet scientist who's like makes biological weapons basically. And the scientist uh, engineers them to be, it's super soldiers really. But instead of doing like a Captain America style super soldiers, it's very dark and goes into like the psychology and the, the sort of problematic background, like idea of it. And the fact that these kids have been experimented on their entire lives. And the story is like really, really political and it's military as well, because they're all like commanders in this enhanced army that's out for hire. So the, the company that is like, is the, company Nathaniel Dex's company um hires out military services in full so a country could just buy the army or buy their air force or buy a mixture of the two and you know and then defend their country against any kind of threat using this loaned army um so yeah it's, it's sort of like putting a corporation behind munitions and behind the war yeah, like yeah. the Elements of war, and then I've got my the audio drama that's currently going out is set eleven years before that novel, so it's when oh, the main that's character. Cool. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's like the te they're they're teenagers, so in the novel they're like twenty six and twenty seven. In the audio drama they're fifteen and sixteen, and oh, cool. yeah, they're uh, it's at a very different point in their lives. So, yeah. I can't remember if I saw you on Twitter or Facebook talking about the book and I was like that just sounds so cool because oh my gosh now I'm going to totally blank I have to look on oh um it sounded a, had a lot of um, very similar with the corporations which I really liked personally um was from like dark matter uh where they mm -hmm. had like the different corporations in space and to me like they did not use like you know they did different stuff with them but I just didn't feel like they used them to their full potential um mm -hmm. And I've always thought about writing about them more. So when I saw that you had said that out of corporations, I was like, oh, that's really cool. Because I just, again, I think that's a really cool, you know, thing that is in modern day, right? That yeah. makes sense in sci-fi that a lot of people aren't doing. So for me, that was really cool. It's this sort of like capitalist idea. And then the fact that like in my, in my story, Nathaniel Dex, who's this sort of clearly a, a protagonist there, and he's um, an antagonist as well. And um he has this company and then he buys an island and moves the company there and then says, well, it's now an independent nation that he oh, rules. Cool. So he no longer has any sort of um, company, like any countries governing what he can do, limiting what he can oh, wow. produce or anything like that. And that really frees him up in terms of what happens to the kids because obviously there's wow. nothing then restricting what he does to yep. them or the other kids that come in to the army and it's free for all really uh from his scientist point of view and yeah, it gets yeah. dark and it's it's sort of like a closed country like from the outside it looks very different but from the inside it's and and there's like a non-disclosure agreement that big when you, <laughs> when you go near it and yeah it's uh it's serious stuff so it's it's very dark but definitely a sort of like it's, it's uh, yeah, it's corporations and darkness, really. Yeah, it sounded, I mean, it definitely sounded really cool. I was like, oh, that's really neat. And I do like how you had the super soldiers in there, too. I was like, oh, those are cool, you know, because I feel like people did them. But I don't know, my friend brought that up. He's like, you know, like, no offense to any Marvel people out there, whatever. But, you know, like and Deathstroke, I guess it's another one. But like everybody always just does the super soldier thing, but doesn't really take the humanity you know, like how it really affects people. I think that's why people like the newer Captain America from the movies more than some of the comic stuff is it, it humanizes them more. You, know, you see the more yeah. human side of them. And I just think in terms of writing, it hasn't been done very well. Um, you know, especially in books. 
so. Yeah, I think there's a very definite sort of like cheese factor and the fact that these people yeah. would be heroes and things. And yeah. no, I mean, the, the kids in my books have been raised by psychopaths who have tortured them since yeah. they were children. They are yeah. not nice people, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, you, you absolutely love them because you get them, but at the same time, they do horrific things. And actually that's something that they do do in Marvel because you know, the opening sequence of any Marvel movie, they are killing people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yep. they, and they're just having a chat while they're doing it. The, the movies don't dwell on the fact that loads of people, they've yep. just slaughtered a whole boatload of people, but that is what they're doing. Um, so, yeah. I saw a really cool shirt uh, that uh, like somebody on Etsy had for Marvel, and it was like had the aliens from the first Avengers movie, uh, and it had like a picture, and it says, aliens are people too. And <laughs> It's just funny that you mentioned that because I was like, that's so true. Like, you know, and I think a lot of times we gloss over that with the heroes, you know, especially for Marvel. And it's like, you know, I, that's why my friend was like, you're talking about Batman and you know, particularly like Michael Keaton's Batman and stuff. And that's why I'm, we're kind of interested to see what Robin Pattinson does. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, like it looks like a great grimdark version, but not the traditional Batman that him and I prefer personally. Um, but yeah, I definitely, we had this huge debate with these, like whole group of people on Facebook about the original Batman from like the you know 90s cartoon versus Marvel and we're like oh he's so much more I don't know we just thought like he was so much more heroic you know because he found a way around all the, the different things and in society like you know the different um you know things that he had to deal with at that time too so it was kind of interesting but yeah I think you make a great point that a lot of people gloss over all the people that they just slaughtered <laughs> especially Thor is just like boom oh, <laughs> Like, you know, you know how like I wonder about this in terms of um sort of violence on the street because the stuff that happens in those movies, it oh, will yeah. kill people. Yeah, and yeah. that but these people are just getting up and walking away. And I'm like, how many people get beaten up these days? And those yeah. the people who are beating them up just keep going because in the movies oh, yeah, yeah. those people would then get up and walk away. But yeah. in real life, they're not gonna survive that. That's oh, yeah, yeah. you know, serious damage. Yeah. And you know, this yeah. unrealistic sort of portrayal of how much violence and a beating a person can take before oh, yeah, yeah. you know like no totally, totally. I, and I, I'm a teacher so I see it all the time like I, I see it a lot of it too you know and I'm like we saw a couple of videos this year where I was like wow like I it looked like a movie you know and you're like how did that kid you know get hit that way like it, it literally does transfer over that's yeah. why I was talking to somebody I'm like you know that's why I like books more because you can it's still there but it's like it's different I feel like I feel like it's a different psychology uh, but yeah. yeah, I think you make a great point. It's like they, and then it's just funny you mentioned because my friend just talked about that, how they glossed over, like he won't let his son watch them, you know, because he's too young and he feels like he's not going to understand that. And then it glosses over the fact. And I was like, yeah. you know what? I was like, you're a good dad. I was like, I didn't even consider that. So yeah, I, guess. And I think that's what makes Spider-Man so great. It's like, you know, he, especially Tom Holland, like, you know, like he does a lot of funny things whenever, but he's not just eradicating people like Thor <laughs> or even Iron yeah. Man. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I think also, that's a good, that's an interesting thing, though. You know, is that the psychology behind that? So, yeah, it'd be cool to read about. It's accountability and stuff yeah. like in audio drama. There's this um, really cool thing because they um, they go out. They've been these experiments and they're deployed for the first time, and for the first time, they're actually out in the world and being attacked oh, wow. and being and and the sort of. effect that that has on them psychologically yeah. and how you know they, they've been they've grown up being told yeah you're like you know you're good at fighting and they've grown up taking their knocks but they've never dealt them to real people before and they've never taken it from real people before yeah, yeah so the fact that they're coming face to face with real enemies and being attacked by real people for the first time yeah. is you know incredibly intense and you know they're teenagers they're 15 and yeah. 16 like that's a lot yeah 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 you bring up a really great psychological point there um which i think makes the writing a lot more interesting personally and makes characters a lot more interesting and i think that's the nice thing about sci-fi you, know, you can uh, yeah create those types of situations for those characters and you know and do that kind of thing you know you yeah. can't really you know fantasy you can kind of but i don't think as much i think there's you know there's different head spaces you can get into so I think it's a lot different, but yeah, yeah, this sounds super cool. And 
really excited to uh to check that out so i saw i remember i can't remember when you posted that but i was like yep save that <laughs> i like put that down for later in my notebook i was like that definitely sounds cool and i was just talking to jennifer swift about this you know we're like i don't know i guess i'm just so like maybe it's because i've read a lot of fantasy and sci-fi but i just craved like the new perspective you know there's only so many different things that you can you know different stories that you can read that have the same general qualities to them and I, I do like when people you know like yourself take that psychology and think okay well what could I do this way to me that just it, it sets my creative brain on fire and makes me think in a different way and I think that as I get older as an older reader you know it's like you can only spend so much time you know again reading the same same old same old so I definitely think that that's where a lot of indie authors have you know, really been pushing themselves. And I think that's what has grown the industry. So I think, yeah. you know, I think that'll be a really cool story. I think it's like yeah. what um, sort of a big influence on me is the fact that I was a medical writer as part of my copywriting background. Oh. So I worked in, as a medical writer for pharma companies and that mm. definitely impacted my work and the fact that it's the, the technology in the stories is mostly biological in nature. So mm. Again, that's another oh, that's thing. Cool. I, I, most of the time, it's weapons, it's it's spaceships, and yes, you know there are weapons and there's airships and stuff in my in my story. But you know, weapons and airships, people people get that. That's you know, they, people are saturated yeah. with about those yeah. things. But what we don't necessarily get is biological changes and physiological changes, and the fact that they've got these like mechanical bionic eyes, and then every time they they focus and see and every time they're like they they have a reaction their eyes were so they have this very sort of they're very aware of the fact that their pupils dilate and and sort of like enlarge and 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 minimize yeah. all the time they know when it's happening um oh, that's so it's they're much more aware of things like that in their physicality than we would be because they have this audio cue going on and you know things like that that are just it's it's very physical it's very biological oh that's cool that's what i was just talking to jen too about you know like um you know taking general interests and then you know or experience and then being able to write in a different way and i think you know everybody thinks it's got to be this but like i'm a yeah. history teacher you know i I really love the Malazan Book of the Fallen books and the thing I like most about it isn't the magic it's more the you know the camaraderie between the you know the people and I thought oh it'd be cool to have like a unit type of mentality yeah. you know so I have Roman I have the ninth legion in Britain and um, they're about to come up against zombies in book one uh, so I'm taking care of the the mystery there none of that silly we lost the paperwork garbage that they're saying now for them uh, so yeah i'm gonna have them face the caledonians and then they have to help each other out and then they just get decimated and there's a lot of heroism you know, stuff like that but yeah i was like i love urban fantasy but like um uh, like like tilda um colt holt was like on with me twice and she was our first uh interview for february she wrote and i just love where she took that concept of like bike games and added fantasy i'm like yeah. to me that's just it's interesting so but my friend said he's like you should just take what you know and then you know change it and I'm like that's such a good idea <laughs> so I yeah. think it's interesting you're that that's playing. what you did you came up with such a good idea like yeah, yeah. It's, it's, you're just playing with what you've got you've yeah, got your yeah. sandbox you go in there and you're like okay I'm gonna have a castle over here and I'm gonna have a whole load of stuff over here and and then you know your, your parents are terrified because what you've made is an absolute masterpiece of gore and blood and like, misery yeah yeah totally i do like how you had the island though too like that adds a whole different how uh, that I'm, I'm mad i didn't come up with that idea that's just a whole whole different political like geopolitical concept that you came up with in the sci-fi world that's just like really interesting and that's what i was just talking to a friend about the other day and he's like oh i just came up with this small detail and i'm like small detail i'm like what i was like that's like he changed a couple of things and i don't want to give it away for anybody but we are having a man after February she wrote but I'm like that was like genius so I think that's a that to me was a really good idea that you did like I really like that personally the little things like yeah. because they're, yeah. a, they're an island like in the audio drama they're not actually recognized as a country at the beginning of the audio drama like Nathaniel's 
told everyone that they're a country, but the rest of the world hasn't recognized them as this, but they've sort mm. of been saying, okay, well, you know, what are we going to do with you? And yeah. then this, they, they have this event in the first episode, the bomb, and they drop this horrible bomb and there's a huge amount of political fallout from it. Oh, wow. And after that, the other countries are like, well, we don't want to touch you because if we claim you, we've got to claim some responsibility for what you just did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now we've got no choice. Like nobody wants to say, okay, well, Dex, Dex Island is actually ours because then they're yeah. going to have to face the music. So they're like, okay, well, Dex Island, fine, be a nation. <laughs> as long as you're having to with you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, right, okay. <laughs> and see, that's an interesting thing too that you just said too, you know, where nobody wants to take responsibility for them as an ally. Like, you know, as somebody that teaches history, like that's so true. <laughs> like, it's like a modern day, like no offense to anybody, but I, I feel that's how, um, you know, like we were talking about this uh, with some of my kids in history class and it's a higher level history class. And we were right. discussing, you know, uh, the United States, um, you know, our ally with Israel. And mm -hmm. they're like, I said, sometimes I think we're just like, what do we do? You know, and I'm sure they feel the same way about us. And so I, do, I definitely think that that's a interesting piece that you added there too. So that's totally true if we look at geopolitical, you know, climates and yeah. stuff like that. So. Yeah, that's so, cool. Uh, okay, we're yeah, kind yeah. of stalemate here. I mean, there was, there was a funny like line at, at one point where he's just like, yeah, okay, nobody wants to claim us, even though the back payment in taxes that we would owe them at this point would <laughs> probably exceed their gross, nas gross national product. <laughs> that's so true. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Because they're oh, a yeah, that's a great detail. Like, They're really rich. They're taking in the money. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If if we got taken oh, by a company, we'd owe them so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh wow, yeah, that's totally true. I do, but it, I think that I just that goes to show, you know. So I don't think the episode that we had, yeah. So it's not out yet, but it'll be out soon uh, with another February Shiro author, and um, it's just interesting where we were discussing those small little details that make things feel more real. Yeah, and I think that's one of them too. You know, is the bag tag is like it really makes you think like man that is this a smart idea or not a smart idea but that is most of our reality today you know especially in the type of climate where you know, look at the you know russia the ukraine for instance it's like we're literally in that situation now it's just interesting that you created that within your world you know with these little details so that's really cool well as they say there's nothing really original and you know it's true yeah Writers can write as much horror as we like, but at the end of the day, it's been done nine times out of ten. <laughs> yeah. um, and worse. Yeah, look, I, and yeah. worse. <laughs> no, I, yeah, yeah. Well, like I, you know, we're trying to give these kids for um, Black History Month like really good examples. And I just had a TikTok go across my for you, and I really liked it. Like it was this guy's grandfather who was talking about, uh, like he was a white airman, and he was talking about, you know, the experiences of the Tuskegee airmen and how. You know, people, a lot of the men in his patrol were from southern United States and didn't want to fly with them and refused to. And I was like, that's a, so I saved it because that's a really good detail for us to talk about. You know, because in the history books, it's one thing to say, oh, these people were, you know, neglected. But it's a totally other thing to have these good examples. And my friend was talking about how, you know, how hard it is to, you know, to really come up with those examples as an author, um, you know, in those small details, like you're saying, you know, and, I just think it'd be interesting again because you're getting the perspective of, you know, like that could be something that, you know, you, you do right later on, like that whole X-Men thing of these people, you know, aren't accepted. And it's like, I think those kind of things give credence to the world that you build. And, you know, it's, yeah. it's interesting to, yeah, it's just interesting, like you said, you know, nothing's been done, you know, nothing's really original. So yeah. I think that's why you have the, the hero's journey pop up time and time again, and people just change it a little. It's like, you know, it's what been around since the beginning of time and we still do it so yeah it's yeah, totally true that, that one is frustrating though because it's like you know then it's not the only story format there's loads of different story yeah. format but oh totally you know it's the one it's the one that everyone sort of falls back on because it's currently kind of the one that's selling a lot and it means that yeah. some of the really interesting story structures out there are just not really you know they're, they're not seeing the light of day um yeah so yeah that's uh, a bit of a my my book is, is like currently not published 
may never be published by a big publisher because this might actually be a bit of an issue, but um, completely by accident, I've written a sort of Lord of the Rings format in sci-fi where I've got three books, each divided into part one and part two. And the entire thing is definitely a single story because I've written them all. Um, book one is repped, but yeah, I've got the entire trilogy. And yeah, it's because of that, the story for book one, while it's complete, it definitely leads into a book two, which then definitely leads into a book three. And, you know, and while I have tried to keep the structure very much like you could read one, you know, yeah, yeah. It, it's designed as an ongoing story and it's not done at the end of book one. Mm. You know? I mean, like Fellowship of the Ring, it's not done. Frodo hasn't yeah. got to Mordor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, like you couldn't- It'd be really think, boring if you did. <laughs> I mean, like imagine these days, these days, like you, as a big publisher, you get like a debut author and you'd say, okay, right, we're going to publish the first book. And if it doesn't do too well, then we won't publish the other two. Can you imagine if that had happened with Lord of the Rings? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. I think it's a good point that you make, though. Like Michael R. Fletcher is one of those with Beyond Redemption, you know, where he got great reviews and for whatever piece, of, you know, reason that just wasn't like I don't remember seeing it the year it came out. And I was like, that's weird. And then I went and bought it later. I seen yeah. a used bookstore and I went back and looked him up and stuff. And I was like, oh, he seems really, you know, really cool. So then I went and um, you know, went to Barnes and Noble and grabbed it. But you know, it's he's he had that experience, and then you know they're like, oh, this didn't sell. Um, they didn't want to do book two, so he went and did book two and three, and then a lot better for him. But yeah, you can only imagine for Tolkien. Tolkien, you're gonna think of that. <laughs> we gotta remember, like J.K. Rowling was what was denied by what, like fourteen, like at least fourteen publishers. I mean, in like five or six years, and it's like I yeah. just know how many people have you know used that as a you know, an inspiration. So it's like kind of scary to think about, but yeah, it just goes yeah. to show you, right? Write your books and the rest will work itself out, I guess. But. It's like The Martian was self-published. Mm. Yep. And then picked up and, you know, as editors there, like, you know, oh yeah, I turned it down, I turned it down. And it's like, come on. <laughs> and look at Andy Ware now, right? <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> He's the one that a lot of people talk about, like him and Anthony Ryan, I feel like. And it's like, I feel like it's totally true. Like, and then it's like, that's what I was trying to explain to a couple people recently. I'm like, I don't focus so much about, you know, like, I, I don't know, I guess, I guess I'm not going to, personally, I'm not going to focus on submitting. I worry more about, you know, getting good books out there and building a platform. And I feel like if somebody really wants me, they can come and, you know, they can come and claim me, so to speak. Um, but, uh, yeah, I just, I think it's, uh, it's interesting to see Brandon Sanderson, you know, with his hybrid publishing and, you know, I definitely think uh, that's the way, like Kevin J. Anderson, I went back on an old interview they did with Vincent Filter and they talked about that, but I do know a lot of people that, you know, really do want to be traditional published and things like that. So, yeah, I just want people to read, I guess, and it's kind of, my friend's like, well, you're kind of weird. I'm like, yeah, I know. I was like, I just want to give books out there, I guess. And, I'm a micromanager, so I don't mind having control over things, I guess, <laughs> but especially book covers, like I've seen some, some friends have some interesting decisions, um, you know, when other people are involved, even like indie publishing and stuff. So I'm like, kind of want to do that. But I guess once I actually have to do my own advertising and pay for it, it's not so much worth it. Uh, yeah, yeah I guess it all. It's the marketing. That marketing, sucks. right? And I work yeah, in marketing. Big M. <laughs> it sucks. Like... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> very true, <laughs> very true. Well, I'm really excited to to read your book one, and I'm really excited to check out your sci-fi audio drama. So I guess we got off topic for questions. Like I said, we just want to, you know, yeah. really just just talk about, you know, what you're doing. And I'm just really well, interested like to go. I really do, <laughs> because I've already gotten a lot out of what you've said about, you know, how you know, just the different details, like, you know, that you have picked for your story, it makes me go back home tonight, when I'm mm -hmm. writing mine, and be like, okay, what do I need to, you know what I mean, like, that's what I find interesting, personally, and I know a lot of people, you know, who, you know, feel the same way about their, you know, the books that they enjoy, or their own writing, and, you know, they want those kinds of things, but how did this sci-fi audio drama come about then, like, was that something that you were looking for, or somebody, you know, approached you, like, tell us that story. 
Uh, well, I was approached, it was a couple of years ago now, and um, Chris Gregory of the Alternative Stories podcast, um, this is a podcast that makes audio drama, but in loads of different genres. And he wanted something in sci-fi and he got in touch and said, hey, would you mind writing an episode? Would you be interested in writing an episode for me? And I was raised on the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy audio oh, drama. Yeah. So I was like, yes, of course, I want to write an audio drama. Um, That's so I cool. did like, you know, yeah, I, I did this one episode um, called The Bomb and I chose, he wanted something like he was saying, maybe we take a bit of your first book and we adapt it and I was thinking well if it does get picked up by a publisher they might want to change it and so I wanted to do something that would be evergreen no matter what so I decided yeah. to focus on an early event in the history of like Dex Island and so yeah 11 years late uh, earlier this event happens I made this this episode around it and it was one of the most successful episodes of the year um, for his oh. podcast. People were still That's listening cool. to it like a year later and asking for more. Oh. So, yeah, I mean, I'm I was, to listen to it. So I'm, I'm ready to go. <laughs> well, I then um, I wrote a sequel for him, and at this point, he was saying we need to do a series. Um, and he, it turns out he is also a Hitchhikers fan always wanted to make a sci-fi series audio drama and loves the Dex legacy, loves the sort of the characters and what I do and was saying, you know, we really need to make this. And I, I didn't believe him at first. I was like, oh yeah, he's being nice. Oh no, 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 he meant it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, so I've now, I've, I wrote a whole series and we're making it now. So. That's, that's super cool. Like when you had said that, you know, like I, had originally approached you you know because again I saw your status and um you know with your first book and I thought oh that sounds really cool so but then when you you know had sent me back like oh I really want to talk about this I'm like oh that's really cool and you know I really like a lot of Spotify shows and things like that that they do uh so to me that was like really neat so I was like oh we got to have her on to talk about this sci-fi audio drama because again that's just using an old media right or you know some newer technology or whatever nothing out of the ordinary like you said you know like much like you know hitchhiker's guy does yes yeah, so to me that's just cool and it just goes to show you that not everything's been done you know or that you could you know redo something that has been done and make it really good well the uh, the audio drama space especially in sci-fi is really coming back and i was actually thinking about what you said about um reading violence in books versus watching it on movies that's something where audio drama really crosses that bridge because you you hear what's going on but the images aren't right there in your head so you hear that there's violence happening but you don't necessarily see it and so it's not it doesn't have the same kind of impact um necessarily like you know it's going on you get much more of a a sense as opposed to a, a sight like having it thrown into your the backs of your eyes you know hearing it and interpreting it is different cool. Uh, asking for submissions for an anthology and I looked it up and I instantly got this vision in my mind and it's, it's basically like um, Victorian-esque kind of That's gothic cool. but it's not steampunk yeah 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 there's no technology there steampunk technology it's it's Victorian kind of gas lamp moody gothic and there's a lot of sort of horror twists to it and and everything it's a really interesting and fun genre and yeah, so I had this sojourn into uh, gas lamp fantasy, and yeah, I love that story. It's coming out. It's coming out at the end of the year, I believe. Um, but the rest of it is really very much sci-fi. But you know, the genre is kind of, in many ways, they're they're very sort of, they're definitely sister genres, really. I would say. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's just it's funny that you mentioned that. Um you know, and I know we got cut off, but, you know, in terms of, you know, different genres that you're writing in, to me, that's really cool, because I did talk to uh, Crystal Matar about, you know, uh, Legacy of the Bright Wash, and I feel like hers could probably, you know, be considered that, because it's Victorian, but it's not steampunk, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we were discussing that, I, like I said, I teach history, so for me, I just, I love that kind of stuff, and if you can mix some, some fancy or some sci-fi elements, because I do, I like steampunk, but I also just want, some different fantasy or time periods, you know, 
uh, with some different settings. So I think that sounds really cool. So I actually got me thinking now, like, oh, maybe that's what I could call a couple of my, you know, story ideas. Maybe that's a yeah. better, you know, better genre for them. So that's really cool. Do it. It's got this sort of like um, urban fairy tale kind of thing yeah, yeah. and like very uh, smoggy London because who needs who needs misty woodlands when you've got London smog? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. that was like uh, Enola Holmes. I just absolutely yeah. loved because I felt like they captured, you know, like what I loved about Sherlock Holmes and just that genre. And I don't know. Yeah, I I, I agree. I, it's just that was a lot, it's of a lot fun. more fun that way. Yeah, it's yeah. it's good urban fantasy, you know. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was a lot of fun. It's just it's just fun, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that'd be really fun to do like urban fantasy, like because that, isn't that that's Orlando Bloom's like uh oh what oh, show was he was in that you know what I mean like that was pretty much like cast lamp you know like fantasy yeah like, yeah fully yeah. what that was called but yeah yeah I, I yeah remember. you got me thinking differently now like yeah hmm. I think I it's... talked about doing like a fire elementalist in the Victorian so I think a gas lamp like detective with. So, you know, like a Harry Dresden, but not in Chicago, like modern day Chicago, but in, you know, gas lamp London, I think would be mm -hmm. really cool. Uh, particularly, you know, with the history with, you know, uh, much like Chicago, you know, mm -hmm. like the history with, you know, uh, firefighters and stuff like that. I think it'd be pretty cool. So yeah, you got yeah. my mind thinking now. <laughs> I think yeah, that's really cool. Really cool. Like I live in um, Reading uh, in oh, Berkshire cool. and, um, there's the old Victorian lamps still around in the park, and, the, and they've oh, got. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, and they've but they've got light bulbs in them now, but they oh, are the old ones. And that's cool. Walking through the park, I was just thinking it used to be someone's job to go around yeah. the ladder and light these at the end of every day. That was somebody's job. Yeah. <laughs> you know, to light the gas lamps. You know, like it's somebody's job to go and ring a bell and wake everyone up at six o'clock in the morning <laughs> to go work in the factory. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, and those are the, again those those little details we talked about earlier, right? Those little details that you can put into you know one of those types of fantasy settings that yep. you know could really, really you know make it feel real in your world building. So I think that's a that's a great point. Yeah, yeah it'd be really cool to see, you know to add a character like that to you know, your gaslight like, fantasy, like, I think that'd be really cool, like, I love those lamps, too, like, there's just some sort of, um, like, Crystal Matar and I were talking uh, before we were started recording about it and stuff like that, you know, the romanticism feeling, I feel like, you know, especially if you're talking about London, and that, you know, I feel like those gas lamps, it, it does give you that type of vibe, you know, and just, yeah. I, th I think urban fantasy comes alive when you talk about, you know, that time period, personally, and I don't think there's enough that's been written for that time period, or in that genre, so. Yeah, that's cool. Maybe we'll get some uh, some great uh, ideas for <laughs> for that genre now. I definitely think of myself like that'd be really cool. So yeah, I like to do new UK, things. So. Walk around some parks, you know, walk walk oh. through London, and you know, it's everywhere. Like I, I wanted to go there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I well, my friend and I talked about making a trip, but we want to go um, like all around like the UK and. You know, we would love to go to Scotland, Ireland. And, like, if we're going to go, we want to actually go, you know. And we talked about going for at least two weeks. So I'm like, he told me, he was like, all your stuff is pretty much set there, you know, and, you know, for urban fantasy. And I'm like, yeah, pretty much. Like, it would be nice to go and <laughs> see things firsthand. But yeah, yeah, it's super I can cool. Recommend, uh, I can recommend Glasgow because that's where I went to uni. Oh, so. that's cool. Yeah, I was there for four years. It was, it was a great, great Oh, season. wow. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I'm not I'm totally blank and I just talked to somebody else that was there um just recently actually and I feel I've been talking to a lot of people in the book community but I just yeah I was just speaking to somebody else on Twitter who uh was just there uh recently I think last year a couple years ago but yeah they're kind of doing like a kind of like an urban fantasy mm -hmm. um and that was one of their settings and I was like oh I'm really excited for this you know because I was seeing their posts so long about you know the area and stuff and places they were going and what they were doing and I just thought oh that's really neat you know like using your experiences so yeah that's really cool I didn't know that that's awesome yeah. um so for that third question uh in what mm -hmm. ways uh do you feel other genres flow into the genre of science fiction I was glad that you suggested that one well 
as I as I mentioned, I have got a list. I wrote a list of all of the different sci-fi subgenres because there are so many, and oh, this is a bit of a hobby. I'm ready to go. Like, okay, I'm going to look into this because, um, yeah, I mean, I I happen to think everything can flow into sci-fi, and to prove this point, this is the list of uh, a list of sci-fi subgenres. All right, so you've got military. Robot fiction, social sci-fi, space opera, space western, the punks, as I call them, which is steampunk, cyberpunk, nanopunk, biopunk, um, superhero fiction, time travel, the regular mashups, so sci-fi horror, comedy, romance, erotica, um, political sci-fi, grounded sci-fi, apocalyptic, post-apocalyptic, grimdark, speculative fiction, retrofuturism, all of the alien subgenres, so you've got alien invasion, alien conspiracy, and you've even got alternate history sci-fi. So, oh. yeah, not even set in the future, it's set in the past, yeah, yeah. but science fiction. So literally everything can tie into sci-fi, which is a fantastic, makes it a fantastic genre and like melting pot. Um, yeah. And, oh yeah, weird sci-fi, didn't even cover that one. That's like... <laughs> China Miovel, who sort of, you know, he, he pioneered his own sort of subgenre there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. sci-fi is, is an interesting one. And um, yeah, so any kind of genre can like tie into it. And when I started writing my book, I know it was sci-fi, but I did an English literature degree. I read very widely in all different genres. And I have to say, I hadn't read too much sci-fi before I started writing mine. And I'm very unusual in that. Like a lot of people spend years imbibing sci-fi through the age yeah. before they set out on their sci-fi journey. And I genuinely don't think that's necessarily, it's, it's not necessary because you can just make anything science fiction. You yeah. can take anything and, and, and feed it into the genre. And you know, I know that there's a lot of writers out there who have drawn heavily on the Greek sagas, and you know, the Matrix was basically first-year philosophy um, at Glasgow Uni. And yeah, yeah. there's a lot of psychological theories, and you know, they and in terms of um, very sort of deep dives into personal reflections on on different like in different situations, psychological theories and and learnings come out in the narratives, and. I, I had this I had this time when I was when um, I was applying to agents. Um, I was asked to talk about my main influences, and one of my main influences was the uh, a section from the biography of Georgiana, Duchess of Devonshire. <laughs> so you know, I'm writing this political sci-fi grimdark thing, and, and I'm inspired by the Duchess of Devonshire. Cool. You know, it, anything. Can just oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's yeah. awesome. That's super cool. Well, you have to send me that list that I'm to try and put like a guest blog post or something like that because then you got me like really interested in all of those and want to. I'm sure the audience too would really like to, you know, like me take the time to actually go through them and you know see the differences and you know, see the different authors and stuff like that. So yeah, yeah, that's super cool. <laughs> yeah, and I got me thinking like weird, <laughs> weird science. Like, that's awesome. Weird science. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That just sounds awesome. I never even considered that like a subgenre, so that's really cool. Yeah. Um, I thought about doing like, a whole thing on different subgenres, so that's actually a really good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, so, that fourth question. Uh, so share with us some of your experiences and tips in submitting your work to literary agents. I'm really happy to hear that you know you had uh, all these ideas ahead of time for that one. <laughs> yes, so um, basically uh, I've already made a video about this uh, because my experience is quite specific, but I have, I have opinions. Um, I submitted to seven agents in total and got four full manuscript requests. So my method, it worked for me. I can't say that it worked yeah, for yeah. Me, but certainly it was successful for me. And I made this video and people have said it's very useful. So links. Which we will be putting the, the description. It, the video will be in the description link for us. So if you guys are wondering what video are they talking about, uh, <laughs> we'll get it in. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I think that the main learnings from that are that you threw the stale covering letter out of the window. Um, 
you're always sort of advised to make it cold and clinical and stick to no more than three short paragraphs and everything. But at the end of the day, I'm me and they're them and I want to be talking to them and I want to be talking to them as me. And, you know, you can't get that across in three stale paragraphs. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I threw that out of the window and the rest came from the heart. Um, so you've got to kind of think of your approach as the fact that this could be the most important professional relationship you've ever had and start from there. And I applied to all of them. I, you know, I, I only applied to seven, so I really personalized the applications. I found out about the agents ahead of time. I often had um, sort of conversations with the agents ahead of time before applying to them. So they already knew who I was. You know, they, they were already aware of me. I was on their radar and then sort of sent my application. And it just meant that I could be from the heart and each one really mattered. And people are like, oh, but you know, then you get rejections and it hurts. It's like, well, rejections are going to suck anyway. Yeah. We're going to get the rejections and they're going to suck. You know, the least you can do is be like, well, at least I put my all into it. Yeah. You know? And I did my best. And, and I thought about it and I did it right. And if they then come back and say, you know, no, thank you, well, what more can you do? Yeah. I do like your tactic, though, like being a person and not a piece of paper. I think it's an easier way to you know to classify it and i think that's contrary to what a lot of people are saying so yeah. when i was you you know you're like oh i got another one i got another one i was like well, i really want to know what you're doing you know so i can you know, pass that on to others i think that's just you know and again like you said you know not everything works for everybody but you might have they watch your video or see what you did and might give them their idea yeah. so i think that's the really the best way to to go about it and you never know right because again these people are people that you're submitting to and you never yeah. know that your way might work for the certain people that other people might submit to so i think that's uh, i just think personally that's really good advice so i'm really think anxious to uh, check that out it's really common for people to be like oh, i'm going to mass submit and yeah. to me, i think that's a terrible idea not least because when i submitted i think i submitted to two and i got feedback from the second one that changed so much better. I ended up rewriting the first half of my book before I then sent it out again. Now, if I'd sent like 10 agents in that round, and that was since I could contact again with the yeah. improved version, and that, you know, are you prepared to throw those away, those applications away when, you know, you've only got so many? Yeah. No, it's totally true. And I guess they really consider that, yeah, that this 10 that would be out the window then. So that's actually a really good point. Yeah. You only get one shot with these people, so yeah. you, know, you don't wanna you don't wanna miss it. <laughs> yeah. I just like how you mentioned just I just like how you just put yourself and your best foot forward rather than, you know, really listening to you know what other people have said. So I just like that. I think it's a better approach. <laughs> you said it right. You just want to be you so i think that's just great advice personally if you're going to be submitting so yeah i think i got way more i got way further being myself than yeah, I got yeah. trying to be the cookie cutter yeah application. as yeah. soon as i is threw it, that out now it's just me yeah like, yeah yeah no i think it's great advice and that's what like most a couple people recently said the same thing They're like you gotta figure out a way to separate yourself from the pack because they get so many submissions and, you know, per day, you know, per week, per month, per year. So I think that's great advice personally. I'm really anxious to to see the video though. I'll be listening to it actually uh, on our drive back to New York. It's one of my, uh, it's on my list for notes for heading back. If I'm going to be driving eight and a half hours, I want to learn something along the way. So, well, that would be a really 22 minutes for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. My wife's like, you have a lot, you have a lot to, you know, to watch. I'm like, well, it's an eight and a half hour <laughs> trip. So yeah, I, I saved a lot for the last couple of weeks. Um, I just think that's great advice personally. Um, so yeah, make sure you guys um, check out Emily's video uh, link in the description for uh, YouTube, Spotify, and RSS.com. It'll be everywhere. 
uh, will make Jimmy Plaster her video all over the internet. So, um, so that's this question. Uh, so where did your character inspiration come from? And now I'm really interested because you explained more about you know, your world building and things like that. So, so where oh, does your inspiration for your characters come from? Okay, well, this, this might not actually be a very useful answer in that it comes from everywhere. Never know. And um, I mean, I think like with the characters from the Dex Legacy, I have had them in my head since I was 15. So they've been around in my head, rattling around in there long enough to have become a cocktail of so many yeah. characters. And, you know, that's, they're, they're sort of taking on a life of their own. But then I've got another thing that I'm working on at the moment. And that thing, it's like the characters in the world have come about simultaneously. And this is something that I advocate actually is that when you're building characters, you build the characters and the world at the same time because the yeah. world makes the character. You don't, yeah, yeah. You, you don't know anything about your character until you know where they're from. And the point of view that they're looking at everything, you know, but from-, yeah, from yeah, exactly. This it's where they stand. It's it's where they're coming from for the entire narrative. And so, if you're building a world, build it from them outwards. Um, you know, or if you've got some world in your head, put them in it, and then work down from there. I sort of see um, the way you do this is um, say, okay, uh, I think I'll be, yeah. So. You think of the character, you think of the world, then you have to ask why. So there's a detail there. So you've got a character, you say, okay, well, they came from this place, why? Well, they traveled there from that place, why? Well, there was a war there and it did X, Y, Z, why? Because of a political situation that happened, yeah. that, that, why? And the more whys you ask, the bigger your world becomes. And the more you get into the depths of what makes the character. Does that make sense? No, it makes total sense. And I just feel like you, again, this is why I do the podcast, because I feel like I've heard people say that, but not in that particular way. <laughs> I like, said it because I was just talking to somebody else about this. Like, I don't know why, you know, you know what I mean? Like when someone just says something in a particular way, you're like, oh, huh, I get it now. You know, like we do that to kids all the time. I'm a teacher, so we do it all the time. You know, like, yeah. A kid the other day was like, I got it. I'm like, we've well, said the same thing. He's like, I don't know. It's how you said it today or your tone or maybe it's your face. Maybe it's like, that's well, but no, I think it makes sense. So I just like how you broke it down that way that, you know, like I've heard a lot of people say that, you know, you need to go character because people have said they're character driven for work. But oh, yeah. Yeah. they haven't talked about those concentric circles that come from that character. So I think you put it in a really good way. It's like it actually me think a lot different now. Yeah. It's like ripples in a lake, or you see it as like the character is a tree, but the roots, they're standing on the world, yeah. they're a tree, but you've got to know where the roots are going or how far, yeah, yeah. in what directions. Yeah. And from that, then your world above them is richer and your character is stronger. You can sort of see it in that way as well. Yeah. The way you do it, ask the whys. Why, 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 why? And it's like going down a rabbit hole, except you want to go down the rabbit hole. And you want to keep yeah. going as far as possible and you know every time you ask why you're going to get more and you know yeah. this may never be seen by the people who are reading the book or may never be heard about but the fact is is that it adds everywhere it adds to everything yeah yeah, yeah. well i like how you said that like again you you, you just need to think of like I have a character that ruined my first book because he decided he didn't want to be a, a constable he wanted to be a thief taker Okay. Well, then I had to figure out what the hell difference that made in the world. Well, it turns out it made a huge difference. Well, he was like, no, this is, I'm like, you're a new character. You came from an old character. I'm like, you're needed to help drive the plot. But I'm like, mm -hmm. you're ticking me off, you know, like now you're making me create this researching, creating this whole new world. And I was like, I didn't really even consider them having police or constables. And now I have to. Well, yeah. now I have this relationship between these constables and these thief takers. And then it just, but you know, my friend was like, oh, this sounds a lot cooler. And I'm like, yeah, son of a gun. <laughs> like, and that's, but and that's again, where you were saying, like, I like yeah. shine together and the wine yeah, yeah, yeah. link and it all yeah. becomes one magical rabbit warren. Yeah. But I like how you said the roots too, because the stronger your roots, right, the 
stronger world builder. So yeah, that's just great imagery and great advice. And I'll be taking it later on tonight when I go to write my urban mythological urban fantasy is what I'm calling it, I guess. But yeah, sure. <laughs> that's great advice. That's great advice. Now, now you're going to have to come back. I'm doing a panel, I'm trying to do a panel uh, podcast. Um, I think I might try and do a couple of them, like hit up your guys' time zone because I know like three people there and then hit up another one. Another one. Uh, and I kind of want to ask all of you guys the same questions. So three panels, <laughs> same questions for world building. And it's, it'll be interesting because they're different exercises to see how everybody's different. But yep. To see that everybody comes up with some cool ideas. So I like your your take because your take is a little bit different than somebody else that I'm thinking. I won't say the name. I don't know if they're going to want to do a panel but i'm hoping that they will because you guys i think would come up with something really really cool um but yeah it's, it's interesting um so that was number six right so how do you go about your world building so you go character driven then and then go out then yeah i do so yeah it's char it's character centric and i don't i'm not into the idea of like the author building a massive massive world and then putting the character in it because, because you don't need it you don't need it and then the temptation to take where you want to go not where the character needs to go and yeah, then yeah. It, it's it's a very different story um so yeah i mean take it everything needs to be from the character's point of view and and everything else is superfluous really um but another another method that i use in world building which is a fun one is walls building a world with walls because there are walls, whether they're invisible or whether they are structural, walls define worlds. And whether you are on the inside of a wall or on the outside of a wall, or what you consider to be the inside and the outside is going to be different to what another character considers to be the inside and the outside of the wall. Mm. So, you know, inside your house, you know, inside your town, you're on the inside. But to somebody else who's on the outside, they're like, well, you're outside my world you're somewhere else. So you've got, you've got to know where the walls yeah. are. You've got to know who's on one side, who's on the other, what falls within a certain perimeter. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a structure thing. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Once you start looking for walls in our own world, you realize that they're everywhere, even if they're mental, you know. It's funny that you say that. I just, I like how you put that. Cause I, I did that physically. And it's also metaphysically in my first book. Like I built this rich, the city to be around the rich. And uh -huh. then the outer part is called the gutters. So it's literally the whole outer structure. And yeah. they're meant to be the soldiers, the taxpayers, whatever. And then you actually go into the rest of the city. So they're the first ones that everybody needs, but they're also the first ones that will be sacrificed. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I just like how you put that. Yeah. I like how you put that because. I do think my friend said he's like oh you should do that and then put it in your architecture so i just think that's just great advice and after i did that i world was world building differently for my city and i felt like my city was a character form so yeah. i just think i think that's a great advice person yeah i love yeah, how cities can be different characters because i've got quite a few yeah. cities in the book and they're all structured quite differently and the way they're structured really feeds into that character like you say i mean you know no two cities are the same and they say a lot, like, again, place and characters and characters coming from places. Yeah. These cities are all very different. And you couldn't imagine one character being from another city. They have to be from that city because yeah, yeah. they are of it. You know, it's, it's yeah. like it's, they come from each other. Um, so, yeah, place and character is as a bit. It's just fascinating and it's so fun to play with. I love it. <laughs> Yeah, it's almost like, I like how you said that, it's almost like the city is like a, a parent, like a father or a mother. It's they're part of the family rather than just this place that they're at. So, yeah, yeah. I think that's a really, really good way to think of it personally. <laughs> Got a lot out of this. I'm going to have to take a lot of notes when I'm doing editing tomorrow, <laughs> which is great. That's <laughs> why I do the podcast. Uh, for that last one, uh, so what are your current projects, news, updates? This is always one of my favorite things. Um. Current project, so yes, the Jet Legacy audio drama is currently going out. We've got episodes going out every two weeks, so just tune into that. Um, the episodes just keep getting stronger, and our cast is amazing. Wow. And, like it's a full cast audio drama. We've got a lot of characters going on, lots of diverse voices, 
and it's a lot of fun and also very dark and political and messy and meshed and yeah Story all then. Of things all of the other right. things and yes yeah. so we've got that going on um and that's really mostly it for what is going on in my life moment, apart from the book that's still out on publisher's submission if you're a publisher and you're looking for a dark room dark sci-fi <laughs> Hear that, hear that audience, you have to share constantly so Emily can get her book submitted so I can read it and then review it on the channel because you guys want book reviews so you got to get more authors read and published that way we can get these things to you. <laughs> Preferably me, yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Preferably Emily. She's first. The blood road. First. Yeah, then, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Emily, I want to thank you for coming on. Thank you so much for rescheduling it. Uh, once again, just like our Crystal Matar episode, you guys, because of my best friend, will never see these crazy uh, tech things that have happened to me and Emily. Uh, you're just going to see this great episode of great writing advice that she has given you. Uh, so thank you, Emily. And uh, thank you so much for coming for February, she wrote. We would love to see you again in the future. You know, hopefully once, you know, your book is submitted and everything and, you know, good to go, uh, you know, keep us in mind for, you know, that kind of thing. We'd love to have you on again for that or any other time you want to come by and talk about world building or anything like that. So I can talk about that forever. So yeah, yeah well, anytime. Like said, keep in mind, keep in mind, I am going to start inviting people for the, the, the panel. So We'll do a, a UK one for that time zone. So I'm trying to figure out a good time to schedule it, but I'll definitely send you an invite for that. So be on the lookout for that one. Yeah, definitely. Count me Perfect. in. Excellent. Well, you have a great rest of your evening. Thank you so much. And I will talk to you on Facebook or Twitter, my friend. Thank you very much. See you later. Bye. Bye.